Junior Toloy and I jumped into a canoe and sadly waved to our friends as the canoe pulled away from the shores of Madre John. As we landed on the other side of the river, more and more people were arriving in haste. We started walking, and a woman carrying her flip-flops on her head spoke without looking at us. Too much blood has been spilled where you are going. Even the good spirits have fled from that place. She walked past us. In the bushes along the river, the strained voices of women cried out, God help us, and screamed the names of their children. Yusufu, Jabu, Fode. We saw children walking by themselves shirtless in their underwear, following the crowd. My mother, my father, the children were crying. There were also dogs running in between the crowds of people who were still running, even though far away from the harm. The dogs sniffed the air looking for their owners. My veins tightened. As we walked six miles and were now a Kabati, grandmother's village, it was deserted. All that were left were footprints in the sand leading toward the dense forest that spread out behind the village. As evening approached, people started arriving from the mining area. Their whispers, the cries of little children seeking lost parents, and tired of walking, and the wails of hungry babies replaced the evening song of crickets and birds. We sat on grandmother's veranda, waiting and listening. Do you guys think it is a good idea to walk back to Moambo? Junior asked. But before either of us had a chance to answer, a Volkswagen roared in the distance and all the people walking on the road ran into the nearby bushes. We ran too, but didn't go that far. My heart pounded and my breath intensified. The vehicle stopped in front of my grandmother's house, and from where we lay, we could see that whoever was inside the car was not armed. As we and the others emerged from the bushes, we saw a man run from the driver's seat to the sidewalk where he vomited blood. His arm was bleeding. When he stopped vomiting, he began to cry. It was the first time I had seen a grown man cry like a child, and I felt a sting in my heart. A woman put her arms around the man and begged him to stand up. He got to his feet and walked toward the van. When he opened the door opposite the driver's, a woman who was leaning against it fell to the ground. Blood was coming out of her ears. People covered the eyes of their children. In the back of the fan were three more dead bodies, two girls and a boy, and their blood was all over the seats and ceiling of the van. I wanted to move away from what I was seeing, but I couldn't. My feet went numb and my entire body froze. Later, we learned that the man had tried to escape with his family and the rebels had shot at his vehicle, killing all of his family. And the only thing that consoled him, for a few seconds at least, was when the woman who had embraced him and now cried with him told him that at least he would have the chance to bury them. He would always know where they lay to rest, she said. She seemed, she seemed to know a little more about war than the rest of us. The wind had stopped moving and the daylight seemed to be quickly giving in to night. As sunset neared, more people passed through the village. One, married, one man carried his dead son. He thought the boy was still alive. The father was covered with his son's blood, and as he ran, he kept saying, I will get you to the hospital, my boy, and everything will be fine. Perhaps it was necessary that he cling to false hopes, since they kept him running away from harm. A group of men and women who had been pierced by stray bullets came running next. The skin that hung down from their bodies still contained fresh blood. Some of them didn't notice that they were wounded until they stopped and people pointed to their wounds. Some fainted or vomited. I felt nauseated and my head was spinning. I felt the ground moving and people's voices seemed to be far removed from where I stood trembling. The last casualty that we saw that evening was a woman who carried her baby on her back. Blood was running down her dress and dripping behind her and making a trail. Her child had been shot dead as she ran for her life. Luckily for her, the bullet didn't go through the baby's body. When she stopped at where we stood, she sat on the ground and removed the child. It was a girl and her eyes were still open with an interrupted, innocent smile on her face. The bullets could be seen sticking out just a little bit in the baby's body and she was swelling. The mother clung to her child and rocked her. She was in too much pain and shock to shed tears. Junior, Toloy, and I looked at each other and knew that we must return to Matrujong because we had seen that Moembo was no longer a place to call home and that our parents couldn't possibly be there anymore. Some of the wounded people kept saying that Kabati was next on the rebels' list. We didn't want to be there when the rebels arrived. Even those who couldn't walk very well did their best to keep moving away from Kabati. The image of that woman and her baby plagued my mind as we walked back to Matrujong. I barely noticed the journey, and when I drank water, I didn't feel any relief, though I knew I was thirsty. I didn't want to go back to where that woman was from. It was clear in the eyes of the baby that all had been lost. You were negative 19 years old. That's what my father used to say when I would ask about what life was like in Sierra Leone following independence in 1961. 
It had been a British colony since 1808. Sir Milton Margai became the first prime minister and ruled the country under the Sierra Leone People's Party, SLPP, political banner until his death in 1964. His half-brother, Sir Albert Margai, succeeded him until 1967, when Saka Stevens, the All People's Congress APC party leader, won the election, which was followed by a military coup. Sakai Stevens returned to power in 1968 and several, several years later declared the country a one-party state. The APC began the sole legal party. It was the beginning of rotten politics, as my father would put it. I wondered what he would say about the war that I was now running from. I had heard from adults that this was a revolutionary war, a liberation of the people from corrupt government. But what kind of liberation movement shoots innocent civilians, children, that little girl? There wasn't anyone to answer these questions. My head felt heavy with the images that it contained. As we walked, I became afraid of the road, the mountains in the distance, and the bushes on either side. We arrived in Machurjong late that night. Junior and Taloy explained to our friends what we had seen, while I stayed quiet, still trying to decide whether what I had seen was real. That night, when I finally managed to drift off, I dreamt that I was shot in my side and people ran past me without helping as they were all running for their lives. I tried to crawl to safety in the bushes, but from out of nowhere, there was someone standing on top of me with a gun. I couldn't make out his face in the sun against it. The person pointed the gun at my, at the place where I had been shot and pulled the trigger. I woke up and hesitantly touched my side. I became afraid, since I could no longer tell the difference between dream and reality. Every morning in Machu Drong, we would go down to the wharf for news from home. But after a week, the stream of refugees from that di direction ceased and news dried up. Government troops were deployed in Machurjong and they erected checkpoints at the wharf and other strategic locations all over town. The soldiers were convinced that if the rebels attacked, they would come across the river. So they mounted heavy, heavy artillery there and announced a 7 p.m. curfew, which made the nights tense as we couldn't sleep and had to be inside too early. During the day, Gabrilla and Coloco came over. The six of us sat on the veranda and discussed what was going on. I do not think that this madness will last, Junior said quietly. He looked at me as if to assure me that we could go home soon. It will probably last for only a month or two, Toloy stared at the floor. I heard that the soldiers are already on their way to get the rebels out of the mining areas, Gabrilla stammered. We agreed that the war was just a passing phase that wouldn't last over three months. Junior, Toloy, and I listened to rap music, trying to memorize the lyrics so that we could avoid thinking about the situation at hand. Naughty by Nature, LL Cool J, Run, DMC, and Heavy D and the Boys. We had left home with only these cassettes and the clothes that we wore. I remember sitting on the veranda listening to Now That We Found Love by Heavy D and the Boys and watching the trees at the edge of town that reluctantly moved to the slow wind. The palms beyond them were still, as if awaiting something. My eyes closed and the images of Kabati flashed in my mind. I tried to drive them out by evoking older memories of Kabati before the war. There was a thick forest on one side of the village where my grandmother lived and coffee farms on the other. A river flowed from the forest to the edge of the village, passing through palm kernels into the swamp. Above the swamp banana farm stretched into the horizon. The main dirt road that passed through Kabati was rutted with holes and puddles where ducks liked to bathe during the day, and in the backyards of the houses, birds nested in mango trees. In the morning, the sun would rise from behind the, the forest. First, its rays penetrated through the leaves and gradually with cockroaches and sparrows that vigorously proclaimed daylight, the golden sun sat at the top of the forest. In the evening, monkeys could be seen in the forest jumping from tree to tree, running to their sleeping places. On the coffee farms, chickens were always busy hiding their young hawks, hiding their young from hawks. Beyond the farms, palm trees waved their fronds with the moving wind. Sometimes a palm wine tapper could be seen climbing in the early evening. The evening ended with the cracking of branches in the forest and the pounding of, of rice and mortars. The echoes resonated in the village, causing birds to fly off and return curiously chattering. Crickets, frogs, toads, and owls followed them, all calling for night while leaving their hiding places. Smoke rose from thatched roof kitchens, and people would start arriving from farms carrying lamps and sometimes lit firewood. We must strive to be like the moon. 
An old man in Kabati repeated this sentence often to people who walked past his house on their way to the river to fetch water, to hunt, to, pop, to tap palm wine, and to their farms. I remember asking my grandmother what the old man meant. She explained that the adage served to remind people to always be on their best behavior and to be good to others. She said that people complain where, when there is too much sun and it gets unbearably hot, and also when it rains too much or when it is cold. But she said no one grumbles when the moon shines. Everyone becomes happy and appreciates the moon in their own special way. Children watch their shadows and play in its light. People gather to the square to tell stories and dance through the night. A lot of happy things happen when the moon shines. There are some of the these are some of the reasons why we should want to be like the moon. You look hungry. I will fix you some cassava, she ended the discussion. After my grandmother told me why we should strive to be like the moon, I took it upon myself to closely observe it. Each night when the moon appeared in the sky, I would lie on the ground outside and quietly watch it. I wanted to find out why it was so appealing and likable. I became fascinated with the different shapes that I saw inside the moon. Some nights I saw the head of a man. He had a medium beard and wore a sailor's hat. Other times I saw a man with an axe chopping wood and sometimes a woman cradling a baby at her breast. Whenever I got a chance to observe the moon now, I still see those same images I saw when I was six, and it pleases me to know that that part of my childhood is still embedded in me.